Professor Albrecht Stamper, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, you're very welcome. And hello, and hello, Eldemir. Well, we are here to talk about rapier in the Kingdom of Eldemir. Can you tell us a little bit about what rapier is in Eldemir? Well, uh, rapier is one of the uh, different martial arts that we practice in the Society for Creative Anachronism and in the Kingdom of Eldemir. Um, it is a, an attempt to recreate a style of fighting. Um, initially, we were focusing on the late 16th century, but we've expanded to go everywhere from the very early 14th century through to the end of the 16th century. So, because as we discover more and more source material, we've been sort of able to expand the things that we study. It is a recreation of a civilian style of combat, so not necessarily a military style of combat, but something that would be used in a civilian context, like a duel or a tournament or something like that. We have a number of examples of it being of duels being fought using uh, swords from that time period, and we're attempting to recreate that style of fighting. And the material that we're using is we're basing it on uh, extant um, manuals that were written during that time period. Um, studying those manuals, like from the earliest one we have is from the very beginning of the 14th century and all the way up until the early 17th century. And we're using those manuals and attempting to interpret what's in them and recreate the style of fighting that was done. And in Eldemir, we're allowed to practice rapier at events. So we have rapier tournaments at events. And we can even go up to uh, what are called melees, where we have multiple people on each side um, in a larger sort of style of combat. Uh, we also have like local practices. And it's the local practices where we teach the fundamentals and then the more advanced lessons to those who are interested. Unfortunately, due to the current situation, we can't hold practices, um, but uh, there are things you can do at home to practice. I've been noticing a plethora of videos appearing on YouTube with people demonstrating various types of rapier and longsword and all sorts of different things. Now, now many people who may not be familiar with rapier might be thinking of, say, the fight scene in The Princess Bride with Inigo Montoya and the Dread Pirate Robert. Examples, actually. That's the kind of sword fighting you're talking about? That is indeed the kind of sword fighting I'm talking about. Admittedly, they're doing stage combat, um, but it is a very, it's one of the best fight scenes ever committed to film. Um, they actually talk about some people in that scene. They mention some names, and the names that they mention are actually real people. So, uh, for instance, they talk about um, Benetti's defense. So they say Benetti, they talk about Benetti's defense. Well, Rocco Benetti was a guy who uh, immigrated from uh, Italy to England in the late 16th century, and uh, along with a guy named Saviolo, opened one of the first fencing schools in Britain, in England, like one of the Italian fencing schools in England. Um, they talk about uh, Capofero. Uh, Capofero uh, was a Italian um, sword master who wrote a manual in the early 17th century. Um, and it's one of the very common manuals that we use in the SCA to recreate um, that style of fighting. Uh, they talk about Tybalt. Tybalt, correct. So there is Tybalt. Uh, Tybalt is actually probably refers to a guy named Gerard Tybalt who was a Belgian uh, who wrote in, the, in the, the first quarter of the 17th century, wrote this fantastic, beautiful fencing manual, gorgeously illustrated, just as the rapier was going out of style in Europe. It was being replaced by a different weapon called a small sword. So it was like the last gasp of the rapier. And then, then for some reason, they jump back a hundred years and they talk about a guy named Agrippa. Um, who is Camillo Agrippa, uh, and he is a Italian mathematician and sort of Renaissance guy who was tired of getting beat in one particular style of fighting, so decided to create his own. 
And he's actually one of the first people to advocate the thrust as the main form of attack. So all of the people they mention in that scene are real people. So Goldman, the guy who wrote the book, I got that right, did his homework. Would you recommend someone interested in rapier look up some of these maestros of the past? I would highly recommend it. Uh, they make for a fun read. Um, you get to see all sorts of interesting illustrations and often people horribly running each other through in various gruesome ways. So, um, for instance, this is a uh, Niccolo Giganti. Um, this is an interpretation of the School of the Sword uh, that was done by Aaron Taylor Niedema. Um, and you can see all sorts of, I'll try to hold this in a bit close. I believe that book is available on Amazon. Indeed. And uh, some poor guy being run through the head. Oh my. Now what kind of equipment would a, a, a person interested in rapier be looking to acquire? Okay, so um, what we are doing is we want to make sure that you are safe while you're fencing. So we can do this in a number of ways. Um, we want to protect your, your body. We want to protect your head. We want to protect your throat. Um, we also want to protect some of the more vulnerable areas of you, like your armpits, your groin, the inside of your thighs. These are all areas that if you were stabbed in for real, it would probably be fatal or at least incapacitating. Um, so for the head, um, unfortunately I didn't bring an example with me, my apologies, but we use a modern three weapons mask which a uh, three weapons mask is, it is either, it means it's good in modern fencing for oil, epee, and saber. It's also called a 12 kilo mask um, because that's the standard weight of it or like the amount of force it's supposed to take. Um, that is the standard that people use in the SCA. People can upgrade from that. They can use more period styles of headwear, uh, including So this is a reproduction of a 16th century style helmet called a version A. That's lovely. Adapted for fencing by having this protective faceplate put on it. So oh, in one second, I actually have an example of. So that's custom made by an armorer? Uh, it was, well, the helmet itself was made, was sort of mass produced um, in India, which is where all the sort of European arms and armor seem to get made nowadays. Um, and then it was modified with the faceplate and everything. So this is an example of a uh, 12 kilo three weapons mask. So this is a standard fencing mask. These are fairly readily available from a number of different places, um, modern fencing suppliers included. So as an example of the contrast to that, um, you also want to have your body protected, your torso protected. Mm. So there's a number of different ways of doing that. Um, the standard that most people use are multiple layers of cloth. We have a testing method um, that we use. It's a color drop tester. And um, basically you drop a weight with a sort of point on the end of it. If the, doesn't get, if the armor doesn't get penetrated, it passes, you're able to use that. Usually three layers of a good weave of linen will do the trick. There's also more modern examples. Um, this is a spectra jacket. Mm -hmm. It's a one layer, uh, it breathes um, and it wicks, so it, it wicks sweat. Um, I find these are really brilliant um, because they're, you can wear them under other things and uh, they are have a really high level of protection, um, over 800 newtons. Um, and they're really, really, really good for keeping you safe. Um, can I go back to your drop test? Um, sure. Who conducts the drop test? Ah, so the drop testers, well, there is a position in Aldemir and all of the SCA called a uh, fencing marshal. Uh, the marshal is the person responsible for safety. They conduct, they can conduct practices. They can, um, they um, officiate at tournaments and um, they do things like inspect you to make sure that your armor is safe and they test your armor to make sure that it's safe. So, now we've got your head and your torso. Probably want to have your throat protected as well. So what we often will use is this is called a gorget. 
because it's designed to cover the gorge, this part of your neck, around the sides, and the spinal notch right here. Mm. So the gorget, um, there's a number of different examples. This one is a combination of leather and um, steel. You can also get solid steel ones where ones are made solely out of leather, like a hardened leather, mm -hmm. make it protect your throat. Uh, gentlemen are required to wear groin protection because it's a good idea. Um, uh, ladies are, it is optional, but there is a kind of groin protection that they can wear called a jill, which is the female equivalent of a jock. They can also wear cups to protect uh, upper torso. Um, so there is that options for them as well. Um, things like the arms, and the lower legs don't have to be protected as much. They can just have a single layer of material, but uh, the torso has to have the full armor protection. The back of the torso has to have the full armor protection. The throat has to have the solid protection. The face and the head up to here have to have the solid protection. The hands, yeah. The hands can be gloves and the gloves can be of any type. They can be cloth gloves, leather gloves. Uh, they only have to be a single layer of material. Now you've described the equipment for heavy rapier. Is it different for cut and thrust? It is slightly different. So first of all, we'll talk about uh, heavy rapier. So heavy rapier um, is the primary kind of fencing that we do in the Kingdom of Eldenir. There is something called light rapier, which involves uh, modern fencing weapons, and let me actually, the epee. We no longer use the epee in the Kingdom of Eldenir. Uh, there, it's very rare to find a kingdom that uses it anymore. So what we are using are reproductions of as close as we can get in a lot of cases to weapons that were used in the 16th, early 17th century. I will show you an example. Not sure. So this is a late 16th century rapier. Uh, this is actually an almost exact replica of one from the Wallace Collection in England. Uh, it was made by a company called Castile Armory, and it was all it was all custom work. So uh, you have the pommel, you have the grip, you have the hilt, which is um, as you go through the 16th century, these become increasingly more complex. Um, sure. As a guard to protect your hand, you have the blade. So on this one, the length is about 46 inches. So it's a fairly long blade. And again, over the 16th century, there was a tendency for blades to get longer and longer up to the point where you had some that were up to your armpit. Uh, well, yes, um, up to four feet in length. Now, would that be a two-handed sword? Nope, that would be a single, that would be a single-handed sword. They were getting ridiculous because the idea was that <laughs> if my sword is longer, I can hit you first, even though it was actually kind of unwieldy. As um, a shooter fighter, I can understand that. <laughs> so the longer the sword, they thought, the better, and it got ridiculous. Um, but this is, so this is one example of a raker. I have a couple of others. Um, but again, this one is the, as close to I could get as an actual reproduction of a period piece down to the the, um, the metal color, this part here is called a fuller. So it has the same fullering on it, the same taper. Everything is essentially the same. And that would be used in heavy rapier? Correct. Would that also be used in cut and thrust? This one, yes. Well, the other style of combat that we do in Eldenir um, is a more recent one. Uh, it's odd that it's a more recent form in the SCA, but it's an older form than the heavy rapier that we do. In terms of time period, we do a form called cut and thrust. Uh, it's an interesting term because in rapier, we do both cuts and thrust. Um, but in the rapier, the main form of attack is a thrust. And we can do what's called a draw cut, where you just sort of lay the sword on and pull it across a person. Mm -hmm. As opposed to cut and thrust, where I can actually percussively strike the person with the edge of the blade. Um, this is a cut and thrust sword. Uh, you can see it has a very rapier style handle. It's uh, mid 16th century. 
Um, one of the things that you might notice is that it is slightly shorter than the rapier because um, it is actually easier to throw a cut with a shorter blade than a longer blade. Hmm. It's just a smaller circle. Um, and now just when you're holding it, that's the way you would standardly hold it is with your finger hooked over here. So that gives you more control over the blade. It almost reminds me of a saber. It is in a way, though a saber would be curved. Yes. Um, and you actually did see sabers in 16th century in parts of Eastern and Northern Europe, places like Switzerland. You actually had curved swords coming into play more commonly in Western Europe. Would that be legal for cut and thrust? It would be absolutely legal for cut and thrust. As long as it meets a certain standard of flexibility, the blade is okay. Uh, the blade has to, we have a flex test. I won't go into the details, but um, the flex test just means if it flexes a certain amount at the tip, it's okay. Uh, and this one passes for both heavy rapier and for cut and thrust. With the addition of more percussive strikes, are there um, requirements for added armor? There are indeed. Um, the minimum required is uh, so, uh, solid or rigid protection to the back of the head, mm -hmm. and padded elbows. That is the minimum. I don't suggest the minimum. I suggest a few extra bits. Uh, <laughs> so I wear solid elbows, I wear knee pads, um, and I wear band braces that cover my upper arm mm. uh, up to my wrist. And the gloves that I wear are padded cuff because getting whacked right here on your wrist, really smart, I can tell you from experience. So again, the main difference is that we can throw cuts, uh, with percussive cuts with the edge of the blade. Okay. Here's an example of some gloves. Okay. These ones look very high up in the arm. That looks like it would give you good coverage. Yes, and the ones that I have are actually, the, the cuff part is actually padded. Now, um, more recently, I know uh, Duke Edward has talked about spears. Correct. As well. So there has been an experiment over the last several years to incorporate uh, spears, which are basically a long stick with a point on it, um, into the kind of fighting that we do. And we do have examples from the period manuals of them showing how to fight with spears. Mm -hmm. um, the The... My understanding is that the, the head of the spear is basically a rubber simulator. Um, it's not a steel weapon, unlike the rapiers and everything that we use, but um, that is the safest thing that they thought would be effective for using spears. Um, I believe they can be used in either single combat, which is interesting, or they can be used in sort of melee combats as well. So multiple people on the side. I um, believe they're still in the testing phase. Um, it's close to legal now. It's been incorporated into the rules as far as I understand. Uh, but yeah, not every kingdom has adopted them. And again, the, the best person to speak to about that would be probably somebody like uh, Duke Sir Edward the Red, who uh, is a great enthusiast for things like Spears. My knowledge is not that great because I haven't really participated that much. Though I have fought with Spear before and it's a lot of fun. Now, one of the things that I know I love about watching rapier is that there's a great variety of things that you can find a rapier or fencer using. Do Correct. you have some things that you can show us? Absolutely. So um, I've already showed you like a single sword. So what you would normally do when you start rapier in uh, the SC is you start using the single sword and you can also use your hand. Your hand can be used to defensively parry, uh, to knock a weapon out of the way it can even be used to a certain extent to grasp the weapon. Mm. We are allowed to grasp the weapon. It's basically the way we played in Elamir is I grab, move it, and release. I call it catch and release. So grab, move it out of the way, release. If the weapon moves in your hand, then you're gonna lose the use of your arm. Um, I'll talk about how we determine blows in a moment. Um, but so, I have my rapier. There are other things I can use with my hand. Um, so after you've gotten sufficiently good with your rapier and your hand, you can start adding other things. 
uh, one of the most common items is a dagger. Hmm. A dagger is like a short version of a sword, uh, very similar. Uh, usually in the 16th century, much simpler hilt. But uh, the dagger is usable to carry. So you can use to knock a weapon out of the way, move it out of the way. And if you actually get close enough, you can use the dagger to attack. Um, a slightly more substantial object would be a buckler. So this is a pretty standard 16th century buckler. Uh, it's a, again, it's a defensive object, basically to protect yourself, to defend yourself, to knock things out of the way, to keep your opponent from hitting you. Mm -hmm. Different ways of using the buckler. There's uh, the Italians have their sort of style of using the buckler. The Germans have their style of using the buckler. Um, a number of the of the 16th and 17th century manuals have different ways of using the buckler. The actually the earliest manual that we have which is uh, from the early, early 14th century, possibly the late uh, 13th century. It's called the uh, MS, or Manuscript uh, 133. Manuscript 133, it's also known as the Tower Spec Book. It's also known as the Royal Armory Spec Book. It's known as the Walpurgis Spec Book because it has a woman in it, in Walpurgis, who is one of the earliest examples of a female fencer that we have. Um, it is a sword and buckler manual. So it has basically a student and a monk having a, uh, showing off various styles of fighting. And it's one of the earliest extant complete systems of fighting that we have. Um, it, it sort of, it talks about everything, um, or at least as much as most fence manuals ever did. So again, so buckler. Um, there is a larger version of buckler. This is called a rotella. It's in Italian, it's called a rotella. Uh, it is a kind, it is a shield. Um, it's a largest round shield. In English, these were referred to as targets. Um, and again, it's just a, a much larger way of protecting yourself. It is a little bit more unwieldy than a buckler. Um, and they distract more conventionally, so rather than grasping it from behind, you're actually strapped into it. Much like a shield for heavy armored combat. It, yes, you could definitely use this for armored combat. Um, definitely see this being used in the context of fencing in the 16th and early 17th century. The specific one is painted up as if it were being used by a border horseman who was a kind of soldier who um, patrolled the border between Scotland and England in the uh, 16th century. Hmm? Um, one of the flashier ways of defending yourself would be using a garment, uh, in this case something called a cloak or a cap up, mm -hmm. defend yourself. Now it's fortunate to see someone using a cloak that has started off as her skirt. Yes. And she kind of went. She did, and she was wearing trousers, thankfully, underneath. <laughs> but she uh, removed the cloak and then used it. Yep. So a cloak was basically a common item that a gentleman would wear. Uh, they were of varying length. This is a fairly short one. Um, they go anywhere up to knee length. Um, and the cloak was basically, if you were in desperate straits, you had your rapier, you didn't have a secondary weapon like a dagger or something. You could pull up, pull your cloak off, and use that as an extra protection. Um, what you mostly see in the period manuals is they sort of they wrap it around their hands, leave it a bit of it dangling, and they just basically can use that to knock things out of the way and give their hands a bit of extra protection. Not very effective against the cut or against the thrust, but pretty effective against the cut. Um, mm -hmm. the thrust would go right through that, so you want to be careful. But yeah, um, you can basically use that to knock something out of the way. It is very flashy. Actually kind of reminds me of um, bullfighters. Torridors. 
Yeah, there is a method in the SCA that's often taught on how to use the cloak, which is basically this. And it looks very cool and very flashy, but it's not very effective. And I've never been able to find any evidence that that method was ever used in me, period. I actually wrote I guess the words. cloak and I did not find, I found this a lot, but I never found that sort of running it around. There are certain things that we can't do with the cloak that they could do in period for safety reasons. I, I cannot throw it over my opponent's head mm. and then stab them while they're trying to untangle themselves. I can't throw it at their feet. I can't tangle them up in it. Um, but I can use it defensively to protect myself. Not terribly chivalrous to do that, is it? You know, but when you're fighting for your life, which is what these um, incidents is often involved, pretty much anything like. Can a fencer also fight with two swords? Yes, indeed. So, um, in period, you often would find examples of rapiers that when it was on your hip, it looked like a single rapier. But you would draw it out and you would go click and suddenly you would <laughs> because it was put together in the same quote unquote case. And we refer to that as case of rapier. So whenever we're using two swords, we call that case of rapier. Do you recommend that new rapier fighters uh, or fencers practice with both hands? I absolutely recommend it, and that's always the way we teach. That will lead us into how we call blows. Um, but again, here's an example of case. So we have one sword, one sword. Defensively, mm. offensively. It's probably the most complex form that we do because there is always that possibility of getting yourself tangled up. So you have to be very careful and very aware. But it's also a very effective style and very popular in helmet. Now, one last form I want to, sorry, I'll turn back to the camera. One last form I want to talk about is two-handed sword. So this is a two-handed sword or a long sword or a Langenschlecht in German. Um, this sort kind of sword can be used in either regular fencing or it can be used in cut and thrust fencing. Um, but it's again, it is a two-handed sword, so you are two hands on it. Um, very, very powerful for parrying, uh, very powerful thrust. Um, it can be very, very effective. I can really get uh, opponent's weapons out of the way with this. Uh, the place where it usually falls down is if they have a secondary weapon, like case or dagger. Uh, I can clear the one weapon, no problem, but then I have to worry about the second one. Um, and these, uh, the long sword isn't as nimble as, say, a rapier would be, um, but it is have a lot. It does have a lot more power to it. So again, we have the long sword, which is a lot of fun. And there's a lot of material that talks about the long sword, both in Italy and both in, in Germany. Uh, there's a whole tradition in Germany of fighting with the long sword, which is quite extensive. I have seen a number of fighters using long two-handed swords, and it's something that I know I have on my wish list. All right. So in terms of how we do a fight, um, we have to determine who wins. Um, in the SCA, we use what we call the honor system. So if you are hit with a blow that you think would have been sufficient to incapacitate you, you basically say, good, I'm, that, you know, you've, You've, you've had a good strike on you. Um, the two, the methods of striking are with the point, which is the thrust. You can use the edge, as I mentioned before. The way we do it in, in a heavy rapier is you lay the blade on and draw it across the person, or you can push the edge of the blade across the person, or you can tip with the tip across the person in sort of a a cut called a stramazone, uh, just using the tip of the cut, the, the tip of the blade to do the cut. Um, well, you mentioned before when you were talking about using your hand yes. as a secondary as uh, a, carrying yeah. weapon, <laughs> um, that someone could take out your hand. Correct. So again, in terms of blow calling, so um, again, we use the honor system. So if somebody strikes me to the face with either a cut or a thrust, that I think would have been sufficient to incapacitate me. So, um, so the head is like, 
a kill zone. So that ends the fight. The throat would also end the fight. Anywhere on the torso, including the armpits, would end the fight. Um, the groin would end the fight. Um, if I, for some reason, turn my back and I'm striking my back, that would end the fight. Um, the inside of the thighs would end the fight hmm. because major arteries. Mm -hmm. Like a major artery ends the fight. Um, so that's how we call blows. Now, there's a number of different approaches to, um, if I'm struck in the arm, for instance, or the hand, I lose the use of that limb. So basically it goes behind me. If it is my sword hand, my, my dominant hand, I'm allowed to switch to my other hand and I can continue fighting with my left hand. If I am struck in the leg, there are a number of approaches to this, um, but you can continue fighting from either a sitting or a kneeling position. Um, and recently they've introduced uh, what is called knee walking where if you are struck in the leg, in one leg, um, you can continue moving around from a kneeling position. I believe if you're struck in both legs, you're fixed in place. But you do have that option of still trying to maneuver around on your legs. And I will keep my opinion of that to myself. <laughs> do you um, have, um, we're, I, we're running quite late. Um, we've gone 40 minutes in talking about rapier, believe it or not. <laughs> and I think that's over the, the full episode of Eldemir on Home. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we could have a special feature, just rapier and Eldemir. <laughs> I um, wonder, well, I wonder if you might have any um, messages or any message for new fencers or people who are interested in fencing and have not tried it yet before. Um, my message would be approach the people who are doing fencing. Um, oh, by the way, one little piece of information, it's now officially called fencing. So in the most recent version of the rules, they have not, they no longer use the term rapier. They call it all fencing. Um, so we are now fencing marshals as opposed to rapier marshals. Um, it's a recent, very, very, very recent change because they felt they wanted a more encompassing term than rapier because we don't just play with rapiers anymore. We have cut and thrust swords and long swords and rapiers and all sorts of different things. Actually, one thing I should mention really quickly before we go. Okay. <laughs> swords. This is uh, Dame Asa's sword. It is a, My. so it is a Japanese style of sword with a curved blade on it. And these are perfectly usable in both heavy rapier and in uh, cut and thrust. Um, and so this is an example of a different style and you can fight in a different style, a more Japanese style. Um, you also see curved Mongol type swords, uh, pirate Tetlisi type swords, things like that. So curved swords are actually becoming more and more common. Excellent. So we can expect to see greater diversity, hopefully. Absolutely. In the fencing list. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, so approach the people who are doing the fencing, talk to them. They are um, by the vast majority, a very friendly bunch of people. <laughs> Hope you full of holes. Um, they are very friendly. They were very approachable. Um, they love to talk about what they do, as you can tell from me. Um, I will talk about this forever. Um, and um, give it a try. Um, a lot of groups have loaner equipment um, so that they can get you in the armor fairly quickly and uh, get you playing around. And there's a lot of really good teachers out there. Except for the cup. Oh yes, the one thing that we don't provide for you is a cup. You have to provide, <laughs> your, own. <laughs> provide your own groin protection. Yeah, yeah Excellent. Own. Excellent, well thank you so much for joining us tonight, Master Albrecht. You're I really welcome. appreciate your enthusiasm for fencing. I'm gonna say fencing, not rape here now. Hey. <laughs> and I look forward to seeing you on the list field in the future coming up. I look forward to getting back onto the list field as soon as In the future. In the future, yes. Well, thank you very much for hosting this. I really appreciate it.